we're getting ready to go into a time of prayer and fasting. We're getting ready to go into a time of prayer and fasting. And we do this every September and every January just to come into a space where we realign our hearts and souls with God. We let him do some deep work in us and then we're ready for wherever he's leading us. Look, here's what I know. God has something in store for you. Today, this week, in this next season, in fall, autumn, whatever you call it, a reprieve from the heat. But he has something for you if you will reach out and take hold. If you will meet him where he's calling you, he will do something in and through your life. You might say, John, I'm ready. All right, let's go. You might say, John, I'm not ready. Okay, we're here to walk with you. You might say, John, I have no idea what you're talking about. We're gonna walk with you, but this is a season of allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us. So today we're gonna talk about prayer and fasting for just a moment, and then we're gonna jump into the scriptures as it connects to prayer and fasting and talk about living a surrendered life. So for just a moment, I, I want you to get your pen and paper out, your mobile device and take notes. Prayer and fasting. What fasting is, it is abstaining from something for a period of time for a specific purpose or reason. Abstaining for something for a specific period of time for a reason. We don't just do it to do it. Not like, you know what? Summer was long. I need to shed a few pounds. That's not what it is. Fasting is not, write this down, a diet, though, hey, if you get a few pounds off, praise the Lord. It's not a way to manipulate God. We're not saying, God, I'm doing this, so you'll do that. It's not a formula to how to get your way from him. Rather, it is an ancient spiritual discipline that we put into practice to align our hearts and souls with God. It is an ancient spiritual practice, a discipline, that we put into practice to align our hearts and souls with God and to tune our ears to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and surrender once again to Him. Jesus made this assumption, not if you fast, but when you fast. You might be thinking like, I don't know if I'll do it. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 16. When you fast, if you have your Bible, circle it, your device, highlight it, your notes, write it down. He said, when you fast. Now, when I'm talking to my kids and I say, when you're cleaning your room, it does not mean if you feel like it, if you get around to it. <laughs> I'm saying as dad, go clean your room. And while you're doing it, Julia said to me yesterday, can I finish this episode of a show I'm watching? I said, you may, as you clean the room. She said, can't I wait till after? I said, no, you may not. Mom's coming home soon and I don't need to lose points. He said, when you're fasting, don't look somber, downcast like the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show everyone they're fasting. I'm fasting, I'm so hungry. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. Instead, verse 17, when you fast, put oil on your head. I think nowadays we might say, put some gel in your hair. Wash your face, brush your teeth, paint the barn, whatever you gotta do. So that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only your father who is unseen. And your father who sees what's done in secret, he will reward you. So this is something we do for God, not for anyone else. The Bible mentions three kinds of fasts. I want you to write them down. Because at the end of our time together, we're going to celebrate in baptism and you're going to be challenged to participate in prayer and fasting. So write these down. The Bible talks of three types of fasts. The absolute fast. No food, no water. Raise your hand if you're doing that. Just kidding. Don't raise your hand. This is not recommended for long periods of time, but we see in Scripture when someone was like really desperate. He said, God, I need you to show up in this area. I need an answer. I need help. I need deliverance, whatever it was, and they would abstain from everything. The second thing we see, second type of fast, is a normal fast, usually abstaining from food for a set period of time. We also see a Daniel fast. Daniel fasted and abstained from certain things. He abstained from meat. Maybe there's something specific in your life 
that you are being invited to abstain from in this season. Now look, don't try and trick God, right? Like I hate fish and seafood. I know you're like, John, you're missing out. I'm really not. I've tried it my whole life, enjoy it, eat it in front of me, couldn't care less. I look at it and go, that probably tastes good. I put it in my mouth, I'm like, no, it does not. If I go to God, I'm like, God, I'm getting rid of all seafood for the next two weeks for your glory. He is like, <laughs> yeah, right. And like, it's not something that we don't enjoy, that we don't like, that's not hard, right? That's just playing with God. It's something that we do enjoy. Something that matters to us. Something that's hard to give up. Because we're saying, not just I'm going to give this up, but in this space... I'm going to carve out time to push into you. That instead of going, bear with me, for my cafe con leche, I'll spend five more minutes seeking your heart. Instead of watching or being online, social media, someone said, I don't want the Lord to tell me not to fast social media. Sorry. Whatever it is, that's between you and him, not between you and me. Not taking a roster. What are you fasting? What are you fasting? What are you fasting? But this is something you're saying. I'm going to take time instead of just missing a meal or doing without food and then doing life as normal, but pushing into the heart of God and taking time that I would normally do something else to carve out to seek Him and to connect with Him. Fasting and prayer aligns us to hear the voice of God. We'll talk about this more in a moment, but it's important, and I want you to write this down that when we hear his voice, we do not edit or ignore what he says. That when we seek God and he responds, we do not edit or ignore him. All too often, that's our response. Write down this scripture and I want you to look at it a couple times this week. Lamentations 3.25. And it says this, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul seeks him the Lord is good to those who wait for him to the soul who seeks him so this next season as we're going through prayer and fasting we're going to encourage each of us to wait for him to seek him and to see what he has in store we'll have opportunities to pray in the mornings in the evenings you'll hear about that in the announcements in just a moment take those opportunities some will be on zoom some will be in person you don't have to wait for those moments you can also do it on your own but please make sure that you take those opportunities push in in these moments because if we don't invest the time in times of prayer and fasting nothing changes if nothing changes right so we're going to intentionally take this season this time to push into god to let him do some soul work to shift how we approach this next season of life. Hey, we're going to pray. And then we're going to speak today out of Scripture about living a surrendered life. And then we're going to celebrate in baptism. And talking about living a surrendered life will put completely into practice what we talk about in our time of prayer and fasting. So let's pray for just a moment. Jesus, we thank you for your grace, your mercy. We thank you for who you are. We thank you because you are not far off, disconnected, uninterested, but you are near, concerned, present. You don't abandon us, you walk with us. You said, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. So right now, we open our hands and we open our hearts to you. Not because we've got it all figured out, but because we need you. I pray that you would meet us here right now. If we know you, take us deeper. Like that jump into the deep end of the pool, take us to deeper places. If we're new, remind us and encourage us. We are your sons and daughters. If we're here today wondering if you're real, if there is truth to all of this, would you awaken something in our hearts and in our souls that is undeniable, 
and all of us, when we leave our time together today, may we know we've been with you. And would you infuse the courage in us to trust you as you lead us forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. What's your evening ritual before you go to bed? What's your evening ritual before you go to bed? If you do not have kids, it's much more flexible. Well, I spend some me time, John. I just enjoy a nice dinner, a show, I read. I, I don't know what your thing is, but we all have something we like to do before we go to bed. My kids, before they go to bed, like two things. They want, after we pray, a story if possible, and they want their backs tickled. Now, usually they want mom to tickle their backs because even though dad's a good snuggler, mom is way better at the tickling. Yeah, that's probably true. I'd choose her too. And I remember years ago when, when Bella, our 14-year-old, was just a toddler. She would say, read me a story. And I would take a book to read her a story, and it did not matter the story. She didn't know how to read, so she would make it up. I would start reading word by word what the story said, and she would begin to overspeak me, talk on top of me, and fill in the blanks based on the pictures she saw, right? So there's this story of a caterpillar that finds his way to a leaf and eats the leaf and goes into a cocoon. She made up this whole other story. There's a bug looking for its mom and eats the grain of rice. I'm like, that's the, never mind. And he sleeps in a warm blanket and he gets there. Then Julia, our nine-year-old, comes along. And before she can read, she's asking me to read stories. And, and we have this one book about a tomato fight. Speaking of the tomato fight here in Spain, and she's like, one day, look at the pictures. People didn't know what to do with their tomatoes, so they threw them. And I'm like, well, that's kind of true. And then they laughed, but that guy got hurt, and she's making it up. And then John John comes up with Star Wars books, and he's looking at them. I said, I'll read it, but the Star Wars books have cool pictures, but a lot of text. Don't buy that one. And he's like, read it to me. So I start reading. He's like, I'll tell you the story. He's like, this guy is hanging out with his friends that have light sticks that glow in the dark. And I'm like, they're lightsabers. Yeah, that too. And they're having a party because it's their birthday. And I'm like, you know what? That's right. Amen. Good night. Let's go to bed. <laughs> and he would make up the story. But then there was a point in time when they began to learn how to read. And I would try and look at the pictures and be like, blah, 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 because I'm trying to get to bed faster, right? Because this is mom and dad time. And I'm like, and he saw his sister, and they had dinner, and they're like, that's not what it says. And I was like, oh, your teachers are teaching you to read. 45 minutes later, and that's how Princess Leia moved forward in the galaxy. <laughs> but as I was thinking of that, I had this thought. Isn't that how you and I are? That we're invited into a story that's bigger than who we are, but until we fully understand it, we make it up as we go along. And we're invited to understand that there's a God who loves us and has a plan for our lives, and there's a story that's being told that we're invited into, but then when we actually understand it, we have to make a decision. Surrender to his will and his leading, or just be like, nah. And then there was a man named John who did whatever he wanted. Then there was a woman named you fill in the blank, that didn't listen to anyone else, but she got hers. See, you and I, we are invited into a story that's as old as time. Then God, by his grace and mercy, spoke and created all we have, and he invited humanity to be a part of it. We didn't do well in the beginning, but it gets better. Sort of. Because of Jesus, not because of us. <laughs> We're invited to a story that's greater than us, a story of creation, of love, of sin, that's on us, consequence of sacrifice, Jesus, of salvation, of redemption, of hope, 
so often instead of engaging in the story he's inviting us into, we try and hijack it and tell our own stories. Let's be honest today. I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but let's be honest. We are all too capable of trying to make this story about us, me. Because even though the Bible tells us that when we're redeemed through Christ, he should be central in our lives, let's be honest. Who is central in your story? The answer is simply me, not John, you. Me and my story, you and your story. That is the humanity in us saying, I'm the most important thing in my story. Egocentric, but we are invited when we found hope in Christ to be Christ-centric, Christocentric. In Matthew 16, verses 24 to 26, Jesus says this. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, my follower, must deny themselves and take up their cross. In Luke, Luke says that Jesus said it like this. They must take up their cross daily. I like that clarification. And follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Friends, we are invited when we've been redeemed and restored and found hope in Jesus, received salvation to live a surrendered life. And I want to encourage us today to put these things in practice during our time of prayer and fasting. We'll go quickly through three things this morning, and they are these. Remember, repent, return. Remember, repent, return. How many of you have a good memory? I've been blessed with a good memory. De momento. For now. <laughs> Enjoy it while you've got it. Brandy has not had a good memory since she was nine years old. She says younger. <laughs> but we're invited to remember. Remember who God is, how he's been at work, what he's been doing. And when we look back and remember who God is, it gives us confidence and faith to look forward in who he will be. When we look back and remember who God is, when he's answered prayer, when he's shown up and healed, when he's bailed us out always at the last moment because God likes to wait to the end, it gives us confidence and faith to trust him for where he's leading and what he will do moving forward. Remember him. A.W. Tozer, a famous theologian, said this. And I want to read it and I want us to think about this today. He said, the most important thing about God is how a church, a people, a group, or a person view him. See, the most important thing is how they view him because if they have a higher, low view of God, it doesn't change him, but it can predict with certainty where their future will lead. Did you catch that? It doesn't change God, it changes you. It changes me. If you think very lowly of God, that will impact your future. If you think very highly of God, that will impact your future. And then he says this, and I want you to write this down. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Why? Because it will reveal our wounds, our pain, our past, our fears, our trust, our courage, our hopes, our dreams, our past, present, future. It will reveal how we will trust God. So let me ask you what Tozer said so many decades ago. What comes to your mind when you think of God? What comes to your mind when you think of God? I want you to write it down in your notes because you're taking notes. If you're not, you're starting now. 
Is he father? Is he friend? Is he deliverer? Is he absent? Is he far off? Is he disconnected? Is he something that you're imposing on him? God is present, but it matters what you think in your mind and in your heart about him. It's time we remember. Remember those times he rescued and answered healed and delivered, comforted and showed up. I had a conversation with a friend that said, I just wish God would show up when it doesn't feel like the last moment for me. And I said, yeah, me too. But if he showed up earlier, we would take the credit. (laughs) Look what I figured out. Look what I worked out. Look what I did. (laughs) Woo. But when he shows up in the last moment, we go, Oh, man, I couldn't have done it without you. Hmm. Placed us on a firm foundation. But we don't like the idea of surrender, a life surrender. We like the idea of supremacy, that we are the highest authority, the most important, the greatest. But as followers of Christ, we're invited to take up our cross, die to ourselves, and follow him as his disciples Remember, I want during this time of prayer and fasting for each of us to spend time remembering. Journal about it. Write it down. Celebrate with a friend. Talk about how God has been there. If you don't remember a time where he has, ask him to show up now. Ask him to do something in your life now. The second thing that we need to put into practice as we live a surrendered life is not only remembering but it is to, number two, repent. Woo! Everyone loves this one. Repent. Wow. If you've been around church for any period of time, you know what repent means. To ask for forgiveness. To turn from sin. To make things right. To do a 180 degree turn from what was, and it wasn't okay, and it wasn't right towards God. Let's be honest today. Are you always okay? Yeah, me neither. Someone says, how you doing? And you say, fine. Through clenched teeth. Pain. Uncertainty. Lack of clarity. No clear steps forward. How you doing? (laughs) Fine. Like, someone says, great. Someone says, fine. Someone says, yeah, 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 okay. Pray for them. Because they are not fine. (laughs) Like, I've had so many people, like, how you doing? Fine. What's that mean? Like, I'm still breathing. I ain't dead yet. I still hope that I hope that I believe that God's going to answer those prayers. But we're not okay, right? Let's be real. It's okay not to be okay. That doesn't change God. But it just means we need to embrace him in a present and actual and tangible way. But sometimes when things are not okay, it's on us. Now, sometimes things are not okay. It's not on you. You're like... I didn't ask for this. It's external. I trust you. I'm looking at you. I fix my eyes on you. Cone scripture, meet with the prayer team in a community group, in 12 community groups, you know, like whatever I can get. Showing up to youth and you're 45 years old. It's fine. It's not fine. We'll get you into something else. But, you know, like you were hungry. I'm saying you're hungry. Not creepy, you're hungry. JJ's like, if you're 45, you're a leader or you're out. But whatever. Thanks, JJ. Uh, But look, here's the deal. Sometimes you're not okay, and that's okay. You don't have to be perfect. What you do have to do is draw near to Christ. To understand that sometimes our hearts and souls get out of alignment because we've put ourselves in the center. I put John in the middle. And all this is for John. And we only focus on ourselves, friends. We remember, but then we have to repent. When the Holy Spirit says, I'm making this about you. 
I'm sorry. I repent. You're making excuses to live in sin. You're making excuses to live in sin. Repent. Look, I love when I have conversations with people and they say to me this. But the Bible's changed, right? But God's adapted, right? But now we have more freedom to do whatever makes us feel happy. Jesus said, I am the same yesterday and today and for." Does that mean there's not love for you? There is. Does, not, does that mean there's not grace for you? Thank God his grace is for all of us. Does not that mean there's not a way home for you? There always is. But look, there is a point that we have to say, it's not okay. Sin is sin. The Bible is the Bible. We don't have like, what version are you reading? Well, I'm reading the 18th abridged version modified for the 2023 audience that doesn't want to hear about how this is a story that's not about them. If there's something out of alignment in your life, this is the perfect moment to ask God to forgive you, to ask him to redeem you, to ask him to restore you, and to ask him to repurpose you, to make you new again, we pray every week, I need a fresh start. That's you, raise your hand boldly and say, Ooh, it's been a hard season, but I need to be made new again. But isn't God a God of love? Yeah, he loved you so much, he died. He loved you so much, he won't leave you alone. He loved you so much and me so much that he said, I am unchanging and unending, but you can always come to me, the rock of ages, the firm foundation, the cornerstone, and you can have your life built on something that will last and will matter, and you'll find hope and wholeness in me. That's true love. Not fleeting. Sometimes we need to ask for forgiveness and repent. First John 1.9 1, 9 says this, we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He doesn't keep a list. He doesn't hold you against. He says, if you come to me, I'll forgive you. Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. I love this. Peter's getting real. Peter's like, God's not slow. Though I know you think he's slow, me too. He's not slow as some think he is. Catch this. But he is patient with you. Woo! Thank God he is patient with me. He is patient towards you, not wishing that you will perish, but that you will come to repentance and be in right standing with God. Exodus 20, verse 3, you will have no other gods before me. Verse 4, you will not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or earth below or the waters in the deep. You will not bow down to them or worship them. I am the Lord your God and I am jealous. You ever been jealous? Me neither. He's saying, look, anything you put in my place, that's an idol. Anything that takes all your attention, all your devotion, all your love, it's an idol. And maybe there's some idols in your life that you need to invite him to clear out. I had this conversation with John John like two weeks ago. My six-year-old, he comes to me and he says, Dad, I love you with all my heart. And if you know John John, whoo, he's a daddy's boy. He lovingly cares for mom. He'll hug her. I love you, mom. But he's like, Dad, we need some bro time, some dude time. And the other week he says to me, Dad, I love you with all my heart, but I hope it doesn't hurt your feelings. I love God more than I love you. And he just has that, I love God more than I love you. And he whips his like 1990s hairdo and he goes, that's okay with you, right? And I said, that's okay with me. He said, but you love God more than me, right? And I was like, accountability. Yes, Lord, forgive me. Yes. Is there something in your life that takes priority? 
this is the perfect time in this time of prayer and fasting to come back into a life of surrender to him. You've been adding Christ like an accessory to your life. It's time to stop that and give him first place. How's the Holy Spirit inviting you to be made right, to repent? The third thing after we remember and we repent is this, we return. We return. Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. He made it very clear a life following him would be a life of surrender. I was reading this last week and some theologians were arguing If Jesus says that we are to surrender, to take our cross, how does that affect the idea of free will, if we must follow him? And one said, no, it's only when we actually do submit that our free will is laid down in a beautiful posture of surrender to him. Only when we actually come to him and we say, I recognize who you are and who I'm not, what you've done, and how I am bankrupt without you, do we actually lay this fragrant offering at his feet? But he's out inviting us, not just to get through the days and add us to the conversation, but to return to him. In Malachi 3, 7, scripture says this, return to me, catch this, and I will return to you. Return to me, and I will return to you. John, he was talking to Malachi. He was. The scriptures are both timely and timeless. Timely for the moment it was spoken, and timeless that it applies to all those who follow him at any moment in history. Return to him, and he will return to you. (laughs) I have very passionate children. They are like their mama. They feel deeply and they have strong opinions that are usually right. This last week, Julia got mad about something, my nine-year-old. And Julia is in this season of life where when she gets mad, it's all-consuming, right? And she'll do this, very Catalan motion. And she walks out. And I said, Julia, you're not allowed to walk out. We don't walk out, you don't walk out. We work through our problems. And she said, I'm not ready to come back yet. And I said, well, get your heart right with Jesus. Come back. She said, but I'm still upset. I don't know how to come back. I still feel mad about what my sibling did to me. It's still not okay. How am I supposed to come back from that? And I said, here's how you do it. You take a deep breath, you turn, and you walk back to where dad is. And she turned like a seer. Walking like a samurai soldier. And every step she took towards me, I could see it melting off her. And every step she took towards her father, It was less important and less offensive and less consuming. By the time she got to me, she fell on my chest and wept. I don't want to be mad. I just didn't know what to do. It wasn't my fault. He hit me. She said this. Look, I'm not saying that life isn't real. I live in a real world. And I carry in my body, in my heart, in my soul, in my mind, real scars. And I know you do too. But here's what I know about returning. It is never easy, but it's always redemptive. It is never easy, but it is always redemptive. John, I don't know how to return. Here's how you return. In your anger, in your bitterness, in your disillusionment, in your pain, in your sickness, in your uncertainty, in your poverty, in your success, in your whatever it is you fill in the blank, you turn towards your father and you take one step at a time until you get to your father. You say, I need you. I need you. 
And here's what I know about God. He will put his loving arms around you and say, you've never been alone and I am with you. Does that mean that everything's perfect? No, but he's with you. So maybe today, as we go into this time of prayer and fasting, you're in a good place. Remember and celebrate. Maybe you've been further off than you want people to know, or you've been just out there far enough that everyone knows. doesn't matter. And you need to repent. It's your day. Maybe it's your day to return. Maybe it's a simple step. Maybe it's a long walk. Maybe it's an easy conversation. Maybe it's one that's going to take a lot. How can we help you? We are invited to live a surrendered life. Now that you are followers of Jesus, take up your cross daily. Follow me. Remember, repent, return. In just a moment, we're going to be ready for baptism and you're going to spend time in prayer and reflection as we get ready to launch into our time of prayer and fasting. But before we do, we always want to pause and give the opportunity to know Jesus or to come home. And maybe... You would say, John, you know what? I'm not a follower of Jesus. Maybe you've never made the decision to accept Christ into your life, accepting his forgiveness of sins in the past, and then walking it out day after day in the grace he offers. But maybe today there's something stirring in your heart, awakening in your soul. You say, John, I want Christ in my life. It doesn't mean you have it all figured out. I know you have more questions than answers. What it means today is you're going to take that first step to put your trust in Jesus. And beyond that, we want to walk with you and help with your next steps and the questions that will come. But if that's you, I want to pray with you right now. Or maybe you're here today and you say, John, you know what? I used to be a follower of Jesus. Maybe some people still think you are. But if you're honest today, you would say it's been a really long time since I actually lived for Christ. And maybe today, you need to return. Maybe you need a fresh start, a new beginning, a second chance in him. If that's you, I have really good news. He is excitingly and expectantly waiting with arms wide open to welcome you home and to welcome you back to the family. That's you. I want to pray with you right now. I want everyone to close your eyes and bow your heads. No one looking but you, me, and Jesus. And that's you, and you say, John, I want to ask Christ into my life. Or John, I need a fresh start today. Right where you are, would you just raise your hand and wave at me so I can pray with you? I need a fresh start today. I want to return. Yeah, I see you. Who else? I need a fresh start. I see you. I see you too. Who else? I need to return today, John. That's you. Just wave at me. I need Christ in my life. First time or a fresh start, I want to pray with you. I see you. Who else? Yeah, I see you. I need Christ in my life, John. A new beginning, a fresh start. I see. Anyone else? We're going to pray. Yeah, I see you. Okay. Let's do this. To support our friends who raise their hands here at ICB, we don't pray alone. We're going to pray with you. Let's pray this prayer together, all of us. Lord Jesus, I need you. Forgive me of my sins forgive me of the past come into my heart I accept you as the son of God give me a fresh start give me hope and a bright future life here and eternal Now in Spanish, in Espanol, repeat with me. Jesús, te necesito. Perdóname por mis pecados. Perdóname por el pasado. Entra mi corazón. Dame un nuevo comienzo. Dame esperanza. Dame vida aquí. Eterna. Friends, the Bible says if you ask Christ to come in, he does. The old's gone, the new's come. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. 
If you prayed that and meant it with all your heart, welcome home and welcome to the family. At the end of this gathering, there's a next step table just outside. A friend will be there to give you a Bible, pray with you, hug your neck, answer questions you may have. But to help you take your next steps, do us a favor. Don't try to walk alone. We are made to do life together. And we want to walk with you and help with the journey ahead. Welcome home. And now I want to invite our candidates who are going to be baptized today to go ahead and head that way. Ladies on this side, gentlemen on that side. And as they're coming, we're going to spend a time in prayer and reflection, just a moment between you and Jesus in prayer and reflection. And the questions I want you to be praying about and reflecting about today are these. How have I been living an egocentric life? And how have I been editing or ignoring what God's been speaking to me? Let's take a moment in prayer. We'll come back together in just a minute. Celebrate in baptism.